morning. Down there, and I'm George Simon. Friedrich Sataxia is an autosomal obsessive inherited disease that causes progressive damage to the nervous system. It manifests in initial symptoms of poor coordination, such as gait disturbance. It can also lead to scoliosis, heart disease, and diabetes, but does not affect cognitive function. It is caused by a triplet repeat expansion in the FX gene, which leads to reduced protection. A mitochondrial protein important for iron metabolism. There is currently no treatment proven to alter its natural cause. Friedrich's ataxia is annoying. My walking is my most obvious symptom, but I also have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a thickening of the muscular wall of my heart, making it harder to pump blood around my body. I have acute scoliosis, dislocated knees, and I have nystagmus which is weird, shaky, I think, and severe fatigue. Friedrich's sexier means I have poor coordination, which makes simple tasks frustrating and time-consuming. My name is Georgia. I have Friedrich's sexier, but Friedrich's sexier does not help me. So I guess before diagnosis, we had an average normal life of 15 years. Um, I think this sort of thing makes you reflect a little and on reflection I realised that probably in those days 70% of my waking hours were spent at work or preparing things for work at home and the remaining 30% was house, dog, car, daughter, aging parents, etc. I had high expectations of Georgia when she was growing up, and she didn't disappoint. Academically, she excelled in all her subjects. Extracurriculum, I had a horse rider, a gymnast, a dancer, a theatre school goer, and she had a wide circle of friends. Did I ever consider good health to be a gift? Not for one second. When she reached early teenage years, I saw the first signs of rebellion with Georgia. <laughs> she hated PE with a passion. And I don't mean she just hated PE. We just talked about PE constantly and how much she hated it. She stopped closing doors and started slamming them. In her bedroom upstairs, I could hear her thudding around, which is quite a feat for a little eight stone. Pocket rocket. <laughs> Alongside this, with a wide circle of friends, as most teenagers do, parties came along. And again, the biggest issue was shoes. <laughs> so we visited many shoe shops because Georgia wanted to be able to wear shoes with heels like all of her peers. She wanted to be taller and look older, etc. etc. And finally, in desperation, we went to see a podiatrist to help us out. We didn't have any concerns, we weren't looking for a diagnosis, we weren't looking for any answers. We met a really great podiatrist, uh, a mature lady, who said indeed she could probably help some insoles. Georgia has pescavos, pescavos, and it is more pronounced now than it was then. Um, and she happened to mention when we were leaving that she thought maybe something was a bit off with her balance. And because I liked the lady and I wanted to make her smile, I agreed we would go to a genetics clinic. Never for a second thinking there was any point. So the appointment came around and we went to the genetics clinic. And we almost didn't because Georgia had a field trip and she didn't want to miss school. And I didn't really want to miss work again. However, we went to the genetics clinic. Because she was just 15, she would go and see the consultant on her own, in a room on her own. So I didn't see the lack of reflexes, and I didn't see the white stairs gate when she was at the wall. So when I collected her from the doctor's room, he said to me um, that he would like to take her a test of me and from me and George's dad, and was I aware that Georgia might have 
slight scoliosis. He was another lovely man, although I believed clearly deluded because I was a mother and I knew she didn't have scoliosis because I wouldn't know something like that. And we shook his hand and he said he would probably see us in six months' time to check on progress. And that's when we first went to the genetics clinic. <coughs> Before I was diagnosed, I struggled with PA, and that's mainly what I remember from school, and yeah, I hate it so much. <laughs> I complain about it constantly, but because I was so stubborn, I never told anyone that I was concerned or that I thought there was something wrong. Instead, I'd just be really defensive about it, and I didn't really like my PE teachers. And if they said anything to me, I'd just kind of snap at them. And um, so, yeah, I also remember that in year seven, when I was about 12, I started worrying about what shoes I was going to wear for prom, which was going to be when I was 16. And I was already worrying because I'd look small next to everyone else. Um, I ended up quitting stagecoach, gymnastics, horse riding, dancing, but I just told my mum that I wanted to focus on school or that I wasn't enjoying it anymore, when really it was because I couldn't keep up with people. I thought that if I tried to forget about it, it would go away, and that everything that you bad at, you get better with as you get older. Um, with hindsight, there was a lot of warning signs, um, which I should have maybe told someone about, and it might have made my life a bit easier, but I didn't, so yeah. So after expecting to hear from the genetics clinic maybe six months' time, ten days later we got the card to the door. Our neurologist said he's come to see us in our hometown with his team. And you kind of know. <coughs> I did more research in those 10 days than I thought was humanly possible and could think of every possibility. But I think during that time, <coughs> I didn't ever quite believe that these things that I would read about and learn about would apply to us. The appointment was on March 28, 2012, and that was the day of our diagnosis. And it's what I think of in my head as my 9-11. And that's not because I want to diminish the impact of 9-11, but that's what it meant to me. When the consultants gave us the diagnosis, I knew exactly what he was saying, because I'd read about it beforehand. And somehow, in that room, somebody strapped an iron girder to my chest and I was unable to put it down for a long time. When we left the room, the world didn't fit anymore. Nothing was the same. I lost my confidence as a mother because I've been doing it for 15 years and I thought I'd been doing it well. That couldn't fly anymore, or so I thought. We were sucked into a vortex. The cardiologist, neurologist, orthopedic surgeon, physio. Everybody sitting in silos. There wasn't any good news. Georgia did indeed have cardiomyopathy. She did have acute scoliosis of a 47 degree curve. Her physio arrived for the first session with knee to toe splints which I didn't think were in existence anymore. And then I guess gradually somewhere in this nightmare the penny dropped and this was now our life. And I had to get with the program. So I researched like a demon and again probably more than was good. I asked all the questions you would expect of a parent who has a child been diagnosed. I learned about the taxon and offered to give a man. I wanted to know what treatments were available and why there weren't any treatments. 
I joined support groups. I learned about one in a hundred of us are carriers of Friedrich's ataxia, although we're not tested, generally. And George is fairly typical. She presented her symptoms in puberty, which is kind of what Friedrich's ataxia would lead you to expect. I've met families with children of four or five who have been diagnosed and never been able to walk. They say there's a 1 in 25% chance, that's what the data says, if you have two carriers. I've met families with four children who all have Friedrich's ataxia and become symptomatic in their early teenage years. So I started to search for positives and it was difficult, it was hard. And gradually, through a support group, I came across a Friedrich's Ataxia Centre of Excellence in the US, in Philadelphia, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. There are others. But the guy who was responsible, David Lynch, for running that department, is very approachable. And I did what I tend to do, which was email him direct and introduce myself and who we were. And he invited us to go out and see him. And so we went. And that was our first visit to Trump. And that was in 2013. So I'm the complete opposite. The day I was diagnosed doesn't really mean much to me because I hadn't done any research. So when they told me that I had a hair, I had no idea what that was. And they gave me a leaflet to explain it. And that was it. Um, the only thing I really remember from that day was being relieved when I was told I didn't have to do PE and, <laughs> <laughs> and I know I keep going on about PE but it really affected my life. Um, I was in denial I think. I went to the park after the hospital and I took one of my friends to the side and said I've been diagnosed with this condition called Sexia, and she said, what's that? And I said, don't know really. And so nothing changed immediately for me. It just had a name and I didn't have to do P. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so after visiting CHOP, um, I learned that there's quite a few clinical trials on the go and became more targeted. We've got as patients, or with George being a patient, a very simplistic view on trial. Of course, we're aware of the challenges and the, the funding and you know everything that it takes to get a drug into a trial. But it seemed to me at the time, learning about clinical trials, there was, seemed to be some bizarre things that came into play. We learnt about trials which would be looking for an improvement in vision which is a very worthwhile thing. But trust me, with Friedrich's ataxia, it is not your prime concern. So I started to look at the likely trials that were coming up. And there was one trial we, I watched in particular, and that was for interferon gamma. It was trialed initially in phase one, very small, open label, huge success, in terms of neurological function. The second trial was also, thanks to the second trial was also shown on promise. So after three years, the phase three trial was announced. It was a bit like opening day at the Howard sale because you had to wait for the emails to announce the trial when you had the same chance as anybody else. And we were lucky enough to get on it. It was probably the second most frightening period of my life. The first being, of course, when George was diagnosed and I lost confidence in being able to care for her for a while. It was just a bizarre concept. From our normal life, here we were, signing up to travel to the States in excess of 12 times over a 12 month period, which by the way, we used fundraising. I just want to dispel any myths that we have copious amounts of wealth and cash at our disposal. We have some fabulous friends and family. I was taught how to give injections and interferon. 
It was tiring. It was scary. God, we were being proactive and we were doing something about it. For the first time in three years, we were doing something about it. We were trying to take some control. I read often about the barriers in clinical trials. And one of the things that puzzles me is when reference is given to the barriers of having clients or appropriate patients to participate. In my experience, and I have now met many hundreds of young people who have had their lives hijacked by this terrible disease, I have never come across anybody who would not willingly participate if everything was in the right place. Obviously, I'm talking about finances, time. I just don't understand that, which is why I think patient groups are absolutely the way to go. Um, so the drug intervened on What it actually did for me, it improved my coordination, my balance, my mobility, my stamina and my energy. I needed less sleep to function like a normal person. Um, I was also purely with the cold a couple of times while I was on the drug, which was nothing to do with the drug. But I found that the time it took me to recover from it was a lot shorter than what it would be if I wasn't on the drug. And also, I think it slowed progression down. Now, people would say that I wasn't on the drug long enough to prove that, but I also wasn't on the drug long enough to disprove it either. <laughs> and in general, trials make you feel like you are doing something productive. It gives you back some control that you lost when you were diagnosed. Um, it gives you motivation. For example, I exercise more now because I want to see an improvement. Um, I've got to meet new people. I met the first person I've ever met with their hair on this trial. And I got to travel and go to new places. It taught me what to expect from a clinical trial. <coughs> Sorry how beneficial it is and how much of a great experience it is. Also, there's no reason that other people can't access what we have done. A lot of people with, especially with a pair have said, oh, I'm not rich enough to do that. We didn't, we raised the money from scratch. We didn't have the money there to begin with. And also people have said, oh, I don't know any doctors in America. I'm not part of any patient groups in America. My mum just emailed the doctor doing the trial that we wanted to be on, and that's it. There's no like secret behind how we did it. Um, so the title of this talk is Clinical Trials, Why Bother? But I think the question should be, why not? How right now? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 so I'll now. George has had in total 18 months on trial. The first six months were placebo, which was a bit of a blow. However, the second six months she went onto open label and then the trial was extended into a, into a longer term study. Unfortunately, in December 2016, the pharmaceutical company stopped the trial. Despite overwhelming evidence from all patients, it hadn't reached its primary and secondary outcome, which came from the fast rating scale. And this is something else I just want to say. If it's possible, patients should be involved in the clinical outcomes of trial. The FARS rating scale, I'm sure most of you will know, the Friedrich's taxi rating scale, amongst other things, measures the time of walk. I think with the best will in the world, somebody who has Friedrich's taxi is not going to break into a sprint. With the best drug in the world, 
So I would suggest, respectively, that a timed walk possibly isn't one of the best outcomes. Similarly, a peg test. A peg test, okay, it, it has a place in measuring Friedrich's. George being able to perform a faster peg test <coughs> would not enhance the life. However, interferon gamma did this. So we're currently <coughs> trying to pursue interferon gamma in the UK off label, the only name to patient. It's early days, and if there are any neurologists out there who think they might be able to help, please let us know. One of the main things about the drug, which has been brilliant to see, Georgia has spoken about the risk, that how, how much she has less fatigue. I thought, before George was diagnosed, that I knew what fatigue was. I thought fatigue was being tired, and not being bothered, wanting a quiet day. Fatigue is probably one of the most debilitating things about free drinks, without a doubt. And to see improvement on that was amazing. It was life-changing. So I just wanted to share with you, before I close, a few things that I've learned over the last five years. Acceptance doesn't mean resignation. We have rare diseases and we want to do something about it. Rare doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I've seen stats from all about them. And I've personally met hundreds and hundreds of young people who are affected by this disease. Sadly, some of them lose their fight prematurely. Genetic doesn't mean to be aware in the gym. We don't have anybody in our family with Friedrichs, as far as we can tell, from many years back, as you care to mention. And yet, it still keeps happening. People are extraordinary with their time and their kindness. And I just want to pay tribute to our NHS. There's a lot of problems in the system. However, the people that work for the NHS have kept this lady sane in the last five years. My daughter is everything I knew she would be. She's beautiful, <coughs> she's funny, and she's clever. She's also brave, determined, and strong. And she's become my role model. Because through it all, this young, this young woman, just like she has today, gets up and shows up. Thank you.